You know, I was sharing in our earlier service this morning that the Word of God declares that if my people, which are called by my name, if they would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, it says, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive the sin, and I will heal their land. I don't know about you all, but these meetings, these evening services are designed to intentionally foster um, a culture of unity in our city so that we as the citywide church can come together and war on behalf of our country. Amen. Before I bring our speaker to the podium this evening, I just wanted to also acknowledge um, every senior leader, five-fold minister, those that are here tonight. God bless you, the Stevensons. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for letting, letting us use your church. The other day when they came and uh, came to, to uh, practice, and then um, forgive me if I overlook anybody. If I do, y'all just y'all just pray for me. Amen. And uh, y'all know the Reynolds, uh, Pastor Greg and Pastor Cheryl of House of Liberty Covenant Church in uh, Mount Healthy, and then Pastor Mike Simmons of Life Church in Oak Hills. And then we got Billy Graham over there in the red. Oh no, that's that's David. That's, <laughs> that's my friend, my good friend David Hill, evangelist David Hill. And I'm so excited, David. And a lot of this team were responsible for putting on uh, Hope at the Fountain. And did you guys have a chance to attend that? That was April. Was that April? Dang. This is July? That seemed like that was last month. And uh, yeah, amen. And uh, and my friend Billy. Billy, the name you go to, uh, I, I know Pastor Cletty. What's the name of the church? Heritage Fellowship. Is that in Independence? K Kentucky. Praise Lord. <laughs> amen, amen. Praise God. Amen. And uh, Apostle Amanda, amen, New Creation Outreach Center. They were some of their uh, ladies were dancing with the team. And then I don't know what other churches were dancing. I know it's Tristone, New Covenant, NCOC. Uh, LCCI, ABC, BBD, Bell B of DeVoe. <laughs> Check my flow now, you know. Amen. All these doggone initials, amen. The KOG, the kingdom of God, how about that? Everybody represented. Well, praise the Lord. Well, come on, y'all. Y'all show some love for my good friend, Pastor Greg, as he comes and shares the word with us tonight. Praise the Lord. I was kind of wondering how I'd begin, and um, I'm just going to follow the lead of the man of God who ministered last week. And uh, for those of you who were here and uh, recall his disclaimer, uh, I claim his disclaimer. For those of you who weren't here, uh, I'll sum that up. And he said, somebody's going to be offended by something I say tonight. So uh, let me just um, say in advance, I'm sorry. Um, and if you're sitting on an aisle, you might want to scoot your feet under your seat so I don't step on your toes. Amen. I'm kidding. <clears throat> um, anyone who has um, an electronic device with you, um, whatever that is, whether that's a phone or a tablet or something, uh, will you just lift it up for just a second? Now I noticed that most of the screens are off, but you know just because the screen is off <clears throat> does not mean that there's not a program running in the background. And the same thing's true with racism. That you may look at your electronic device and you may not necessarily know what the programming is. You just know if certain buttons are pushed, certain things are going to show up. And so it is with racism. 
Beloved, we don't like to admit it, but just like our electronic devices, we've been programmed. And there's stuff laid in us that I would submit to you, some of which, I'd like to say much of which, but I won't do that, some of which we don't even know what's in there. But you can tell it's there because when certain buttons are pushed and you respond a certain way, that gives you an indication that there's some kind of programming running in the background that you don't necessarily see show up until the certain circumstances show up. Are you with me? Now, in the book of Hebrews, in the 12th chapter, if you want to turn there, I have no idea what scriptures I'm going to use tonight. But I'll start with this one. In the book of Hebrews, in the 12th chapter, in the 25th verse, it says this. It says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth. Say, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised. We like the Lord's promises when they're the stuff that, you know, blesses us. And, but you realize there's a promise in the scripture where the Lord says that he's going to shake the earth once more. And it says, he promised saying, yet once more. Say, yet once more. Yes. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And then the writer goes on and explains that a little bit. He says, now, this, and then he quotes it, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. How many of you have recognized that there's an increasing level of shaking going on in society today? Now I would submit to you that it's not necessarily new, but it is certainly intensifying. And last week when Pastor Curry ministered the word, he referred uh, in one of his passages uh, to Matthew, the 24th chapter, uh, where Jesus' discourse was explaining to the disciples what the signs of the end of the age were going to be. And in one of those passages, Jesus said to them that one of the signs of the coming of the end of the age, or the change of the age, would be, and I quote, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom shall rise against kingdom. And Pastor Curry told us last week that if we did a little research beyond the English translation of the word, if we went back and looked at original language, which would have been Greek in the New Testament, that what we write nation in the Greek was actually the word, the word ethnos, which we get our word ethnic groups from. Jesus went on as he explained that there's going to be some other signs that show up. And he, after he got finished talking about this, he said, these are birth pangs. Will you say birth pangs? Now, fellas, we don't know much about birth pangs other than perhaps if you're married and your wife has had a child and she squeezed your hand so hard it took the blood right out of it in labor. <clears throat> but la ladies know what birth pangs are. That means contractions. And so the way that contractions work is they start out with just a little something. And you're really not even sure what it is. You kind of say... Hmm. But if it's time, that little hmm begins to show up as something else. Are you with me? If, if labor 
is for real and you're going into the season of labor, then your contractions go from light and spread way apart to more and more intense and closer together. Jesus said one of the things that was going to begin to happen is issues between ethnic groups were going to be growing more and more intense and closer and closer together. There would be less time to rest between the contractions and as it were to catch your breath. Are you with me? And so we see that these birth pangs are intensifying, that issues between ethnic groups are intensifying. Jesus prophesied it, it is going to happen. Are you with me? It should not be happening in the church, beloved. He did not say it will happen in the church. He said it would happen. It's not supposed to be so among us. Are you with me? And so when the scripture says <clears throat> in Hebrews that everything that can be shaken will be shaken because it's showing a removal of some things, it says that only therefore those things that can remain would remain. And then he goes on in the next verse and he says, verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, will you say we are receiving a kingdom? We're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, hallelujah. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, one of the things I want to ask you is if the scripture says, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but there are some things that do not shake. What are the things that are shaking, and what are the things that do not shake? Are you with me? What is it that brings the shaking? See, we see a picture in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when God called his people to Sinai to, in essence, commission them or set them apart in the 19th chapter. And in the 19th chapter of Exodus, God called his people, told Moses to tell them, sanctify yourselves, set yourselves apart, get ready because the Lord's going to show up. And the Lord showed up. And it said when the Lord showed up on Sinai, some stuff began to happen. And one of the things began to happen is the mountain began to quake. It began to shake so much that even though they were at the foot of the mountain, they could feel the shaking. And it said God descended onto Mount Sinai in a cloud. And in the cloud, there were lightnings and there were thunderings and there was fire and there was smoke and it freaked the people out. And they said to Moses, um, tell you what, Mo. I know God wanted to speak to us directly. <laughs> but if this is what that looks like, you can do that. You got the job. We'll just wait to hear from you. Are you with me? And so when things begin to shake, it's actually an evidence that God is drawing near to inspect. See, what's important to God is not window dressing, but foundations. Are you with me? A house cannot stand with the wrong foundations. And so when God draws near to inspect, one of the things that gets revealed is the condition of your foundation. Anybody ever been to Italy? Anybody ever seen a picture of the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Do you know why it's leaning like that? 
Thank you. Something's wrong with the foundation. And you know what? You can stand and look at the building and you can look at it and you can see something's wrong. And that's exactly where the church is today. If you'll stand and take a minute and look at the church as it pertains to unity in the church and our relationships with, with one another across ethnic groups, you can look at the church and you can see it's leaning. You can see that the foundation is wrong because you can look at it and see that it's not standing upright, supported correctly. And part of the reason that we're seeing the shaking right now is because God is actually answering our prayers. He's just not answering them the way we expected him to answer them. How many in here have been praying for maybe years for revival? For an outpouring of the Spirit of God? How many of you have been praying for unity and oneness in the church? And God has heard your prayers. And God's saying, just like he did when they built that tower at Babel, he said, let us go down and see what they're building. Only now when God's coming close, what we're experiencing is the weight of his glory. See, God's not like us in that regard. We know God is holy. We know God is all the other attributes that so correctly identify him. But see, one of the things that, one of the, one of the characteristics of God is, let me say it this way, God is solid. See, I just, I, just, I just told you how old I was because nobody says solid anymore. See, you knew what I was talking about. Thank you for there's at least one witness in the house. <clears throat> God is solid. He is light. There's no shadow of turning in him. Are you with me? God is a God of integrity. He does not change. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. In other words, God is so compact that there's no gaps in him. There's no gap or no difference between the power of God and the word of God. There's no gap between the integrity, the integrity of God, between what he says and what he does. God is faithful to himself, and therefore he's faithful to us. Are you with me? See, if we're honest, we got some gaps, right? There's some, there's some cracks in our character. Are you, are you with me? What are the cracks? Those are the, the issues where what we say doesn't really match what we do. Are you with me? Where we don't always live out the very things that we desire to live out, or we say one thing and we do another. Are you with me? In the Old Testament, when people would go into the marketplace and they were looking for uh, a container, a pot, or a vase in order to store things in, one of the things they would do is they'd take that ceramic vase, that whatever, that fired, it was fi you know, created in fire, they'd take that ceramic uh, pottery and they'd hold it up to the sunlight and they'd spin the pot around because what they were looking for were cracks. See, because unethical merchandisers would take the pots because under intense heat, some pots crack. <clears throat> Hence, crack pots. <laughs> but these, these unethical merchandisers, what they would do is in order to still sell the thing, they would fill the cracks with wax. <clears throat> but if you didn't hold it up to the light, you couldn't tell any difference between what was solid 
and what was wax. But when you got that pot home and you put it under the heat and you tried to cook in it, or over time, that wax would melt and the pot would leak. Are you with me? So what God's doing right now is he's holding the church up to the light. He's holding our belief systems up to the light. He's holding our hearts up to the light. Are you with me? He's holding our relationships with one another up to the light. And he's, what he's revealing is that there's some cracks, not just in the relationships, because we got to admit that, amen? Our relationships with one another ethnically are not what they should be. Amen? But we know that. Most people can acknowledge that. The question is, how come, if we know that, it never gets fixed? Because this, our generation, those of us in this room, and I know that there's various ages in the room, but this is not new. Are you with me? This has been around for a while. So how come we can't fix it? See, because the cracks aren't only in the relationship, the cracks are in the foundations. And so when God comes to inspect a thing, what God comes to do is rest. Will you say rest? Yes. God's looking for a resting place. A place that will accept him and a place that will receive him. And if you'll allow me, a place that will support him. Are you with me? Because the glory of God is weighty. Any of you ever been in a service where you were prayed for and maybe hands were laid on you and the Lord touched you and you went out under the Spirit and you hit the floor and while the Holy Spirit was ministering to you on the floor, you tried to get up. But when you tried to get up, you felt like you weighed a million pounds. What is that? That's the weightiness of the glory of God resting upon you. But see, God doesn't just want to rest on you or on you or on me. God wants to rest. God wants to be able to abide with an abiding presence of his glory upon the whole church. It's what we've been praying for, and it's what he wants to do. See, but in order to support God, in order for God to be able to rest on a thing or in a place, we have to be compatible with him. Because the only thing that will support him is what's like him. We got to be solid in the areas that we're asking God to come into. Are you with me? So God's drawing near looking for a resting place in the church to reveal his glory and do the very things we're praying for. But as God's getting close, all of a sudden, instead of getting better, everything looks like it's getting worse. Instead of getting more solid and more stable, everything's shaking. All that is is God revealing what's not compatible with him. Are you with me? God does that so that the things that are not compatible with him can be removed according to what the book of Hebrews just said. So that what does remain are the things like him. How many of you want God to remove some things in your life that are not like him? Are you with me? See, that includes some of our mindsets and some of our beliefs and some of those programs that I said a few minutes ago that are running in the background that you may or you may not be aware of. Are you with me? In the book of Jeremiah in the sixth chapter, God was talking to them and he, he, gave, he gave an indictment against his prophets in that day. And it's in the sixth chapter, and I believe it's the fourth verse. And what he said is, my prophets heal. Oh, maybe, I was, maybe that's the wrong verse. My prophets heal my people superficially. Or in other words, they only touch the surface issues. He said, my prophets say, peace, peace when there is no peace. 
he goes on in another verse and talks about the people of God or the leadership of God using untempered mortar to close up things that are not really healed. Are you with me? So here's my question. I know this might seem like a long lead in, but if you went to the doctor and the doctor told you that you have a cancer diagnosis and the doctor said, I'll do surgery on you, but I'm not going to get it all. I'm going to leave some cancer in you. Not because I can't get to it, but just because I don't want to touch it. How many of you would want to go to that doctor? How come we go to church services like that? How come when it comes to dealing with issues of race, all we want is warm, fuzzy stuff? How come the only answer that most of us say is a solution to racism is love? And what we really mean by love is, um, say a little bit, but don't go too deep. Touch the surface stuff, but don't get into my foundations. It's okay to talk about the stuff that I'm aware of, but don't go in and touch the stuff that's running in the background that nobody's shown me yet. Are you with me? I want to know the stuff that's running in the background that I'm not aware of. Are you with me? How many do you want to know the stuff that's running in the background that we're not aware of? Praise the Lord. Anybody offended yet? It's early. I'm kidding. <clears throat> Pastor Curry said something last week that he just said a little while ago. He said that all of us are prejudiced, and I believe that's true. Because actually the word prejudice simply means to prejudge. And we all prejudge. Are you with me? You might see somebody dressed in some clothes different than you and you might make a judgment about what kind of person they are by the clothes they wear. You might see somebody driving a certain kind of car and you might make a judgment about that person because of the car they drive. Somebody may live in one neighborhood and you may think you know something about that neighborhood, so you assume the person that lives in the neighborhood is like you expect the neighborhood to be, and you make a judgment about the person in the neighborhood. Some of us make prejudiced judgments around people of different skin colors, or people who, div, uh, who live in other parts of the world, or who are different than us. So I believe we're all prejudiced. We gotta be honest and admit that, amen? <clears throat> Okay, I apologize for this one. But I believe only white people can be racist. And I'll tell you why. Because I believe the difference between prejudice and racism is that racism is actually prejudiced with the power to affect, to affect another ethnic group. Like genocide. It takes power in order to do such a level of damage, not to an individual, but to an entire people group. And in this country, black folks don't have enough power to do genocide or do that level of damage to white folks. We are the majority people group in this country. So I don't believe black folks can be racist. Prejudice, yes. But I don't believe there's enough power for you to exercise that prejudice in a way that affects the people group of Caucasians in a way that affects the whole group. So I believe that racism is actually prejudice with power.
If you'll allow me, I want to spend just a few minutes and talk about some of what I believe are the, um, the character flaws or the doctrine of demons that have been laid into the foundation of society and to our shame show up in the foundation of the church. We bring that leaven in from our upbringing, whether we want to admit that or not. Are you with me? You know, in the book of Revelation, it describes Satan and it uses a name for him. And the name it uses for him is the accuser of the brethren. It actually says that they were glad because the accuser of the brethren had been thrown down. How many of you know, again, if you'll do a little research and you go into the Greek in Revelation where it talks about the accuser of the brethren, the, where in the English we say accuser of the brethren, in the Greek there's a Greek word, and the Greek word is kategorio. It's the word we get category from. So what that means is the operation of the demonic spirit of the accuser of the brethren is to put people in categories to make accusation against them. Not categories for the purpose of identification when you're looking at positive or godly attributes or those things that you hold in favor. But to the purpose of accusation, when you put somebody in a category, know that a demonic spirit is working and not just any old spirit. Actually, it is the accuser of the brethren himself. So we got to be very careful, beloved, the kind of things we say about one another. Because in that scripture, it says the accuser of, of, of the brethren. He's talking about what's going on in the church, not just what's going on in society. Are you with me? <laughs> I'm just feeling after God. That's all I'm doing. Now earlier, Pastor Curry talked about, used, used the word ethnos, and I've used it as well, meaning that in the scripture it said that ethnic groups is who Jesus said would rise against one another. But in that scripture, Jesus says nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He was not repeating himself. And in the Greek, those are different words. For nation, it's the word ethnos. For kingdom, it's the word bestilia, which really means it's talking about a, a government or, as it were, a country or a political state. So what he's saying is that you're going to see wars and uprisings uh, among people groups or people groups against one another and also political states or countries against one another. Why did I bring that up? Okay, this is where somebody might walk, walk out. <clears throat> because I don't believe the United States of America is a biblical nation. Because according to the Bible, biblical nation means people group or ethnic group. It doesn't mean country. That's another thing. So the United States is a country, it is a political state. See, but when God talks about nation, especially if we go to the book of Revelation, it says that out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every people, and out of every nation, you have made us kings and priests unto our God. Do you understand that the biblical expression of kingdom is a multi 
ethnic group. So actually, it is the church that is a nation. Are you with me? Yeah, I, I felt it in the atmosphere just like you did, believe me. Y'all got quiet. Will you turn back with me to, I'm talking about foundation still, so I'm, hey man, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not messing with the curtains and the furniture tonight. I'm touching some foundational stuff, amen. Will you turn with me back to the book of Genesis? And if you're with me, how about if we go to Genesis chapter 9, and I want to read, for the sake of time, just one verse, Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18. And it says, Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. How many of you have ever heard those names before? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. Verse 19, check me out now. And these three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. From these three boys, the whole earth was populated. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Do you realize in those three boys was the genetic DNA of different ethnic groups? Now here's the thing I want to have us look at for just a minute. You'll turn forward with me to chapter 10, and I'm going to jump around a little bit here for the sake of time. And so chapter 10 says, now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the sons that were born to them after the flood. And then through verse 2 down through verse 5, it tells us about the sons of Japheth. Now for those of you who don't know, and I don't have time to break all this down tonight, but if you do your research you'll find that Caucasian or fair-skinned people are descendants from Japheth. The reason, that, the reason that white folks are called Caucasians is because after the flood we were scattered and we settled in the Caucasus Mountains. And that's why we're called Caucasians. But here's the thing I'd like to bring your attention to. It lists the sons or the offspring of Japheth, or in other words, if you'll allow me, white people, and in verse 5 it says, From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated, read with me please, into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, and into their nations. Now how many of you believe that everything that God puts in the Word is in there on purpose? How many of you believe that not just what's in there is in there on purpose, but that the order that it's recorded is recorded on purpose, that that's not accidental? And so in this verse, when it's talking about Japheth and his offspring, 
and it lists the way that Japheth and his offspring move through the earth, it says that the first thing that they're known for is land. In other words, <clears throat> I apologize for this one too. In other words, the most important thing to white people is land. I'll defend it in a minute. <clears throat> it says lands, language, families, nations. Now if you'll read the next verse, it says the sons of Ham, basically the descendants of who we know to be black folks are in the earth, and it lists all the sons and the offspring of Ham. And it goes all the way through verse 20. If you will read with me, please. It says, these were the sons of Ham, according to their, what's the first thing listed? Families. According to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. Do you realize there's a different order associated with Hamitic people than there was Caucasian people. Verse 21 begins to list the children born to Shem. Shem are the olive skinned people generally of the Middle East who we know that the literal offspring of Jesus came through and it says in verse 21 and the children also born to Shem, the father of all the children of Ebar. And it goes on and lists the sons or the offspring of Shem. When you get to verse 31, it says, And these were the sons of Shem, according to their, what's it say? Families, according to their, in their, and according to their nations. Verse 32. These were the families of the sons of Noah, in other words, all three sons of Noah, according to their generations in their nations. And from these ethnic groups were the word divided the earth after the flood. Beloved, what I want to bring your attention to is that the order and the list was exactly the same between Hemetic people and Shemite people, but the list of order was different for Japheth's offspring or Caucasian. Why did I bring that up? Because for the most part, colonization in the earth occurred from Caucasian folks, from England and France and Spain. And what they were most interested in was what? Land. And so they began to go colonize and look for land and what was not important to them really was what the impact of that was to families or the folks whose land that they came and occupied. If you can't say amen, you can at least say ouch. Now, if you will, turn back with me for just a moment back to chapter 9. And here's what happened. You know the story. The ark settled on Mount Ararat. The water went down. Finally, when the land was dry enough, they got out. Some time passed. They began to plant. There was a vineyard. And Noah began to drink the juice from the vineyard that her, had fermented into wine. And Noah got drunk. Noah got drunk and passed out in his tent. And one of these three boys walked into the tent where Noah was laying, passed out naked. And when he saw his father laying there naked, he turned and he went back out to get his brothers. And when the brothers came in, 
They went into the tent, aroused Noah. Noah woke up and said, I'm paraphrasing, what, what happened? And come to find out that his son Ham saw him uncovered and naked. But the boys, the other two boys, Shem and Japheth, so they walked in backward with a sheet, basically, and covered up Ham's nakedness. What's that got to do with racism? Because the next verses, I believe, shifted the course of ethnic history on the globe. I believe it's that significant. Because what happens is, it says that Noah awoke from his wine, and then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. How many of you realize that that passage of scripture has been used by Caucasians around the globe to say that God cursed black people, that the reason that black people's skin is dark was because of a curse, and that it was God who ordained black folks to be servants to Ham and, or excuse me, to Shem and Japheth around the globe. Are you aware of that? Have you heard that? Many black folks have, most white folks have not. Maybe not familiar with the passage, but that doesn't mean that the programming hasn't been running in the background. Now one of the things I want to do right now is I want to, uh, I want to tear down that demonic lie from the pit of hell that said that God cursed black people. In that passage, God didn't say a word. Actually, Noah's the one who spoke. Now, how many of you in here are fathers? How many of you in here are mothers? How many of you would curse your child or your grandchild? How many of you would look at a child or a grandchild and say something about them where you intentionally wanted them to go into a life of slavery or servanthood. What kind of man does that? Look, I know what I'm, I know what I'm touching here. I realize we're talking about somebody who, who most of us in Christendom recognize as a father, are you with me, in biblical history. But God works through fallible men. It doesn't mean they're perfect men. And in this example, Noah messed up big time. Because now, in the hearing of these three boys, from whom the scripture tells us that the entire globe was populated and divided, that every ethnic group came out of these three boys, Noah's words set something amiss into the relationship where now Shem and Japheth, olive-skinned and white, look at their Hamitic brother wrong. They no longer see him as a brother. They see him as a servant. If we want to be completely accurate with the scripture, actually the curse the word curse was not against Ham in the first place. It was against Canaan. So the man cursed his prodigy or his offspring. What kind of man curses his offspring? I'm saying it that way because I want us to see 
how, in, how fallible that is. But beloved, that's one of those things that got laid in our foundations. Ethnic relationships have been wrong ever since Noah spoke those words to those three boys. Because when they began to go out among sons and grandsons and great grandsons, then everybody in that ethnic group looked at the other ethnic group according to the words that Noah spoke over them. And so they carry that across the globe. No wonder African Americans or black folks are the most mistreated, enslaved people on the face of the earth. Because there's been an operating word curse that was spoken at the very foundation or resettling of the earth after the flood. God just wiped the earth clean. Started with a clean slate. And Noah speaks something that sets relationships ethnically among the families or brethren of these boys that we're still living with today. The KKK, who says it's a quote-unquote Christian organization, uses that doctrine of demons because they say it's in the scripture as a justification for ethnic cleansing or racial prejudice or the racism that they espouse. And they're not the only ones who do it. Are you with me? <coughs> Excuse me. So see, from that point on, when you hear the word ethnos, it doesn't mean what God intended it to mean now. Are you with me? See, God never used it in a negative term. But if you biblically research, as I said earlier, the word ethnos, and it means people group, that's what the Bible says. Are you with me? There's no negative connotation in the scripture when God's talking about people groups. As a matter of fact, if you want to know what the end of the story is, or if you really want to know what church looks like, I'm, I'm closing. I'm trying. I'm trying. Will you, let's take a big jump. Will you turn back to Revelation for just a second and the 21st chapter? Now you realize <clears throat> there's no other book after Revelation. That's the last one in there, right? That's the, that's the end, that's, as they say, that's the end of the story. And there's no more chapters. Nope, not in mine. Is there any chapter? You got chapter past 22 in yours? Nope. So you realize God's showing us the end or what, or what this thing culminates and looks like. Are you with me in the 21st chapter? Now look what it says, if you will. Chapter 21, verse 22, I won't get a running start. It says, but I saw no temple in it. It's talking about the city of God. It's talking about the new Jerusalem. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. 23, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Now check me out. And the what? And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth 
bring their glory and their honor into it. Verse 25, its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be, there, uh, there shall be no night there. Last verse. And they shall bring, read with me, the glory and the honor of the ethnic groups into the city. Beloved, we have so much problem with our ethnicity and the uniquenesses and the differences in the way God made us that we just want to act like they don't exist. But I'm here to tell you that when we gather in final state, culmination, New Jerusalem, city of God, no more sin, everything the way God always designed it to be, ethnic groups are still mentioned in the scripture and it says that each ethnic group will bring its glory and its honor into the temple. See, so we want to say things like, I don't see you as black. Or I don't see you as white. I don't know you. <laughs> I don't see you as a woman. Would that bother you? I, I would think it might. Because you're a woman. I, and your wife. Good for you, man of God. <clears throat> what am I trying to say? According to Psalm 139, it says that, that he talks about us being knit together in our mother's womb, right? We're fearfully and wonderfully made and all the scriptures that go with that. How many of you believe that you're accidentally the gender that you are? Do you believe it's an accident that you're a woman? You believe it's an accident you're a man? Or you think God might have done that on purpose? Absolutely, he wanted you to be a man. <laughs> How come we're willing to celebrate the uniqueness in gender in the church, but we won't celebrate the uniqueness in ethnic group? See, because what we're really saying is, God made you white on accident. Let me say it different. God made you black on accident. That you being dark hued was not part of the purpose of God. That's, that's not God's intention. Do you believe that? I don't believe it either. As a matter of fact, 90% roughly of the globe of the earth is made up of people of color. And about 10% of the globe is made up of people of lighter Hugh, I don't believe that's an accident. Why would God do that? I'm trying to close. <clears throat> Can we look at Ephesians for maybe maybe last scripture? Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 8. <clears throat> Are you there? Say amen, jump up and down, throw a Bible at me, do something. Show you're alive. To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see the fellowship of of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ verse 10 now check this out to the intent to the intent that means God is about to reveal purpose 
This is, this is the reason. God said to the intent now that the manifold, say manifold, manifold. that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by what? By the church to whom? To the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that word manifold, in the Greek, you know what it means? Variegated. Let me help you a little more. Many hued. H U E D. Many colored. It's in Strong's. Go read it for yourself. So, in other words, what God is saying is that in order for God to reveal all of who He is in all His greatness and all His uniqueness, it takes many hues and many diverse expressions of God to reveal all of who he is. That's good. That's good. That's good. See, <clears throat> I'm a man. Thank you very much. I was waiting for somebody to amen. I didn't get like that. <clears throat> I cannot reveal the glory of God in the unique way that the glory of God is revealed through a woman. There are some things we have in common. Amen? Not everything's different about us in gender, but there are some uniquenesses. Some of those are physical. Amen? But the physical differences just reveal a slight change in purpose. Are you with me? So it's the uniqueness of the woman that can reveal an aspect of God that a man cannot reveal. And there's a slight difference in the man that a woman cannot reveal the unique glory of God that comes through a masculine or a male. Are you with me? Why? Because God ain't putting all that in one person. He did that one time. It says that in Jesus Christ was the fullness of the Godhead pleased to dwell bodily. Are you with me? Just once, just him, the fullness of the God had dwelled in him bodily. You understand? We talk about fivefold ministry. He was, is fivefold ministry. He is the apostle. Are you? He is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. That's why he distributed, or God distributed him. and his grace gifts among men because nobody else can express it all but him. And beloved, the same thing's true in the church. There is some uniqueness that comes from people of different ethnic group. We got some things in common. Do you eat food? I do. I eat food. Amen. <laughs> You drink water? Yeah. I drink water. Yeah. You go to the bathroom? Yes. I go to the bathroom. You like spicy food? I do. See, I can't do spicy food. The scripture says, one generation shall declare thy works to another. Now, why would God say that? See, because... The earth, the earth changes. I don't know if you noticed that. God doesn't change, but the earth changes. There's some stuff showing up in 2016 in the earth that wasn't showing up in 1920. Are you with me? We got some unique situations going on in 2016. That's why we can't act like it's 1920. That's why we can't do things like it was 1920. 
That's why we can't think like it was 1920 or 1850. And so in each generation, God shows up uniquely because he's using that generation to be the solution to the problems while they're in the earth. They come to know God uniquely for who he is to them in the midst of what they're walking through in the earth. Are you with me? And then they can testify to that God that they came to know to the next generation who hasn't met him that way yet. Are you with me? And as ethnic groups, we're supposed to do that too. Because we haven't all experienced the same thing. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Black folks have been oppressed and mistreated and enslaved and held back as long as we know. You guys have come to know God in a unique way that white folks have never had to experience him. White folks don't really know what it's like to be oppressed or enslaved or how to meet God and not lose your mind in the midst of circumstances. Are you with me? So what most white folks don't know is how much we actually need you. To reveal an aspect of God that we've not yet had to experience. But I'm telling you, beloved, I hate to say it, but I believe it's coming. The shifts that are happening in the globe and the shifts that are happening in the United States, pretty soon, even white folks who are believers are going to end up on the outside of the system. And we don't know how to live on the outside of the system because we've never had to. But I pray to God, those of you of another ethnic group will forgive us and help us through because we're going to need you. I'm not done, I'm just stopping. It says that they would declare the many hued, the variegated, the many colored. Like if you take a prism and you shine light through it and, and you get all those different colors coming of light coming through that prism, right? It says that, 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 the, that the church to the intent, pastor to the intent or the reason God did this is that, that this manifold or this many huge church would declare that to, not to each other. It says that this many huge church would declare it where? To principalities and powers. Beloved, beloved, it's going to take a many huge church to declare to the principalities and powers what this demonic doctrine has been attempting to do all along. And that is keep the church divided. Are you with me? Keep us at odds with one another. Keep these, these ungodly doctrines in our foundations. And I only touched a couple. But they're, they're there, beloved. The church is leaning. And God's coming to inspect the foundations. How many of you want God to inspect all the foundations? Will you stand to your feet with me? <clears throat> How many of you want God to take all the cancer out? How many of you want God to take all the cancer out? Not heal us superficially, but go down and get it all out. Are you with me? He says that, that they say peace, peace when there is no peace. 
See, we think about peace as the absence of conflict, but that's not what biblical peace is. Biblical peace, one of the meanings of peace means wholeness. So when God establishes peace, he makes us whole. Are you with me? Can you just lift your hands before the Lord? Can we just start to perfume the atmosphere for just a minute, begin to pray? Thank you, Lord. If the Lord is something during this word tonight that you need to repent of, can I ask you to do business with God? While God's speaking, while God's dealing with this in this season, God's coming to the church. And when that stuff starts to shake, I don't want to be shaken with it. I want to be disconnected from what's shaken. Are you with me? Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Father, we thank you for light. We thank you for truth. We thank you that your Holy Spirit, whenever you speak, always comes forth in a spirit of love because you always have our best in mind. So we thank you, Lord, that while we're in ignorance that you don't leave us ignorant. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us blind. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us not seeing. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us with doctrines and, and demonic operations in us and mindsets that would keep us from relating rightly to one another. Father, we embrace your word. We embrace your truth. We embrace the light. We give you permission even now, O oh God, to begin to touch the foundations of our lives. Oh God, we ask that you would touch in the deep places, foundational thoughts and beliefs, oh God, that don't match up and that aren't compatible with your resting in our lives, oh God. And in the church, oh God, we pray for the church. We pray for your church, oh God. Raise up the foundations, O oh God, of many generations. Work in our foundations, O oh God. The areas where there's cracks, O oh God, firm them up, shore them up. Make them solid again, O oh God. Insert a correct view of one another back into our relationships, O oh God. Reestablish value and honor, O oh God, back into the core of the way we see one another and our hearts for one another. Cause us to recognize your unique giftings in each other, O oh God. Cause us to see each other correctly, and receive each other correctly. You tell us in, where, in your word that we're not supposed to want, know one another after the flesh, but by the Spirit, O oh God.
Father, I ask that you release even now your healing touch among us, oh God. Begin to move in the house. Even as you've done surgery in some areas tonight, Holy Spirit, I pray, oh God, that you even now begin to bring healing to that which you removed, oh God. truth in the inward parts, oh God. Truth in the inward parts, oh God. The truth in the inward parts, oh God. sing with me. I want truth in the inward parts. Truth in the inward parts. We want truth in the inward parts, oh God. Truth in the inward parts. We want truth in the inward parts. Truth in the inward parts. Oh God, in my parts, truth in my I receive truth in the inward parts. Receive truth. Can you just lay your hand on yourself or even right now? I receive truth in the inward parts. Receive truth in the inward parts. Receive truth in the inward parts. Oh God, truth in the inward parts. Receive truth in the inward parts. 
era la moseri buta era la moseri che era la moseri thank you lord you were called to see your truth ah you say establish establish truth in the inward parts establish truth in the inward parts oh god establish truth in the inward parts establish truth in the inward parts establish truth in the inward parts oh god Establish truth in the inward parts, O oh God. Establish truth in the inward parts. Establish truth in the inward parts, O oh God. Establish truth in the inward parts. Establish truth in the inward parts, O oh God. There's truth in the inward parts. Establish truth in the inward parts, oh God. Establish truth in the inward parts, yes. Establish truth in the inward parts, oh God. Truth in the inward parts, establish truth in the inward parts, oh God. Truth in the Establish truth in the inward parts. Earlier I, I mentioned before Pastor Greg got up to speak uh, that I felt like um, revela revelation is the key to bringing transformation and healing to this nation. And, um, and the ministry of the apostle is a ministry of revelation. Um, the early church in the first century in Jerusalem, was they were able to um, weather the storms and the persecutions of that day, um, I believe because they were anchored in what the Bible calls the Apostles' Doctrine. And um, not only has uh, the adversary uh, attempted to sow confusion uh, throughout the generations, uh, concerning uh, racial racial uh, relations or race relations, um, but he's also been very vigilant in trying to keep apostles out of the church to get people to embrace the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, but those prophets and apostles keep them away. So doctrines like uh, the doctrine of cessationism where apostles were only relevant and needed to lay the early foundation in the church in the first century and after that they weren't needed anymore and all of these other things that um, has been shared throughout the years um, just concerning apostolic and prophetic ministry and and i don't know about you but tonight was so healing it was so therapeutic because of the revelation that flowed from Pastor Greg's mouth and from his heart, from the mantle. He's really, he's really, you know, and he knows this. He's called as an apostle to the Lord's church. And that revelation brings transformation, watch this, to the nations. Not to this nation, but to the nations. And many of us heard things tonight from the scriptures that you probably had never heard before. And that's the importance and the significance 
of the apostles' ministry and how refreshing it was to be washed with the water of the word in the capacity that the Lord washed us with through him tonight. Amen. I'm telling you, one of the reasons why I will not stop saying this, um, regardless of who likes it and doesn't like it, and who I offend or I don't offend, is that we need um, our white brothers and sisters who are leaders in the kingdom of God to be visible and vocal in this hour. Yes, sir. Yes, man of God. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, because when you, uh, when you are in a fight or a battle, like many of us are, and we, we, you know, we talk about spiritual warfare and those kind of things, but, but blacks um, who have systematically been oppressed for generations in this country, um, they feel like, uh, they, we, you know, we feel like, you know, we don't have options, and we feel like there's no hope or no recourse, and so when when that happens people will take the matters into their own hands because they feel like those like the police which the scriptures also uh, say that they are um, authorities that are, or, that are ordained by God but if they if those authorities abuse their authority and, and African Americans feel like they don't have a voice or they don't stand uh, a chance at all in, in even having any kind of um, you know, we talk about the justice system in America. They say things happen. They say, well, let it play out in courts, in the courts, and let the justice, the justice system decide. But blacks don't feel like there's a justice system. They don't feel like there's a justice system. They feel like that the justice system is skewed towards people of color. Amen? And so it's important to African Americans that when you are in a fight like this, that our white brothers and sisters, not just people in the church, but God's leaders, his generals, that you're visible and you're vocal concerning not just, um, and I don't mean to offend nobody, right-wing Republican rhetoric on who to vote for or whatever, but also things that are important to other parts of the family of God. I know that the political process is, is important. Amen. But you have to understand that there are things that are more pressing to black people versus who occupies the White House. Amen. And so it's it's so healing and therapeutic when a person like Pastor Greg would get up and stand flat footed and teach the word of God and impart truth through revelation into the minds and the hearts of people. And here's the thing about truth <laughs> and about revelation is that truth has a way of hitting you um, and you don't know what hit you and you have to go home after a night like tonight and you've got to go back onto YouTube and you've got to really look at what he taught again because you know when you come face to face with truth you've got, you've got two options either you you look at where we could be wrong in our current belief system and just things that we've embraced, ideologies, philosophies, doctrines, things that we have embraced that God is trying to uproot out of us through, this, through the word of truth. Or you can just completely act like a night, a night like tonight didn't happen. And God wrote uh, in the book of Hebrews, he said, in the day that you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. You know, we can't allow things that are so dear to us or so dear to the people group that we're a part of or so dear to maybe uh, uh, our pastors or leaders in churches that we're a part of. We can't allow those things to speak louder to us than God's truth. You know, it's so funny. He mentioned this tonight, one text, and the Lord was speaking this to me through another text in Ezekiel 13 the other day. Because there are many voices in our land right now 
that are saying things like, oh, you know, we can't be divisive and we've got to be about unity and peace and we've got to be about, you know, you know, these things and not fill in the blank. But beloved, let me tell you something. There's a time for peace and there's a time when the truth of God's word actually comes to bring division. Where it actually comes to divide families. Jesus himself said, he said that in a nutshell, that there will be people who will side with me or my truth and it will put mothers against sons, fathers against daughters, so on and so forth, based upon there will be some people that will embrace the truth and some people that even though what they hear, they know it's truth, they refuse to embrace it because of whatever, fill in the blank. Amen? And I don't know about you, but it was so therapeutic, man of God, the, the things that you taught tonight um, to the soul, to the hurting soul of black America. <laughs> to the psyche of black Americans everywhere. It was very therapeutic. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it takes courage and a resilience to stand and to when you seem like you're the only fish swimming upstream and all of the other fishes are swimming in a different direction. And you can wonder, man, am I really hearing God correctly? Because every other voice is saying peace, unity. But that's not what I'm hearing the Lord saying. The Lord's, I'm hearing God saying, you got to stand flat footed. And declare the truth in this hour, regardless of who agrees, who disagrees, who likes it, and who doesn't like it. I count it an honor. I count it as an honor to be dishonored and to be uh, talked about for the sake of the kingdom of God. And when you really know people, you don't go around looking for fights. Amen. You don't go around looking to try to intentionally be offensive. But when I, when I say things like, this guy called me the other day a race baiter on Franklin Graham's Facebook page. Because Dr. Graham, who I love the Grahams, but y y let me tell you something, it is hypocritical. It is hypocritical for Dr. Graham, the Assemblies of God, and a number of other prim primarily white evangelical Christian organizations to not even acknowledge through a condolence the deaths of these people who have died through the hands of police officers. I'm not saying you side whether they were right or wrong, but you can extend a condolence not only to the officers who died, but also to the lives of the people who died. That kind of stuff is important to black people. Amen. And I don't care if they like it or if y'all like I told them in the service this morning, y'all can, y'all go whatever. Because it's truth. And, and I shared last week or two weeks ago that one of the ways that racism is dealt with is through confrontation. Not through patty caking, not through whatever, but through confronting it and, let, and, and us saying, let me tell you why that's offensive to us. And have healthy dialogue like any family should. Let me tell you why we feel slighted when you do that and you don't do this or when the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association will send chaplains to Dallas to minister to the families of, and, and, and the constituents in the city of Dallas with the officers that were slain but not even think about sending them to Baton Rouge or Minneapolis or Houston not even consider it and I am certain that through the uh, the Dallas Police Department that they have resources already to help officers and their families and the people the constituents to walk through that but what about the people that don't have the resources what about them and it seems racist when black ministers have to or people have to always get up and say it because our white brothers and sisters won't get up and say it so it has the appearance to be race baiting. 
or or you know it's just another you know race car or black thing and that's why it can't be like that amen hallelujah and so you have to ch i appreciate every time i've come across anyone uh, online that that is that is speaking what i believe to be the word of the lord in this hour particularly white ministers who are standing and they're teaching and they're saying hey this is not cool mike bickle from ihop did that recently i it brought me to tears there's something therapeutic and healing when you hear somebody like a bickle or like yourself teach like that and it literally brought me to tears to hear uh, uh mike bickle share the things that he shared or chris valentin from bethel church in reading share some of the things that he shared i salute and i applaud those men and I realize that there's always risk involved when you, when you uh, have conversations around controversial subjects or topics. You, have the, you've got, you run the temptation of losing members and relationships and family and God forbid if you're part of a large organization and you're under hierarchy and they might come down on you and say whatever. Listen, I don't care. Because I would rather always be on the right side of truth been on the wrong side with people any day and so man of God I salute you and I appreciate you sharing the way that you share tonight come on stand to your feet everyone it brings healing to the nations of the world and so father come join me uh, pastor let's pray hallelujah And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. Sing that. It's who you are. Yes. It's who you are. And we're loved by you. And so, Lord, tonight we thank you. Thank you, heaven, for hearing our prayers and sharing your words with our hearts. Lord, our hearts, Lord, have uh, been so touched and ministered to by you tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to raise up men and women. Lord God, that are constituents, representatives, ambassadors of our heavenly kingdom to speak the truth in this hour, to not be afraid, uh, Lord God, to be strong and of good courage and to release your love and release your grace, release your power and release your truth. God, I pray that as we leave here tonight, but I just believe, God, that, we, that we're leaving better because we're more together than when we came. Yes, Lord. God, continue through the remaining parts, Lord, of these Sunday night unity yes, services Lord. to knit our hearts together in only a way that your spirit can. Do, Lord. And we bless you and acknowledge you and ask you to continue to lead us and guide us for your great name's sake. And we just worship bless. and honor your name tonight. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Amen. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. Who you Come are. on, make sure you greet someone on the way out. Who you are. And we're loved by you. Who I am. Who I am. Make sure you greet someone on your way out. You're a good, good father. 